This episode of the Structural Engineering Channel is brought to you by PPI, a leader in engineering exam prep for the PE Structural Exam. PPI provides expert prep courses and study resources designed to help you pass the PE Structural Exam the first time. PPI's PE Structural course is fully updated and taught with October 2021 code references and includes new editions of their PE Structural books. PPI's live online courses include hours of lectures, problem-solving demonstrations, exam strategy sessions, office hours, and a passing guarantee. When you take a live online course, PPI guarantees you will pass or you can take the on-demand course for free. PPI has helped engineers achieve their licensing goals since 1975. Check out PPI today at PPI, the number two, pass.com to see all of the resources available for PE structural exam prep. Again, that's PPI, the number two, P-A-S-S dot com. Welcome to this episode of the Structural Engineering Channel, a podcast focused on helping structural engineering professionals stay up to date on technical trends in the field and to help them succeed in their careers and lives. In this episode, we are talking to Joe Dardis, a senior structural steel specialist with the American Institute of Steel Construction or AISC in Chicago about what structural engineers should know about the evolving construction economy. I'm your host, Matt Cardle. And I'm your co-host, Kara Green. Now let's jump into our conversation of the week with Joe. Joe, first, welcome to the show. In your own words, can you please tell our listeners a little bit about what you do on a daily basis with AISC? Sure. Uh, Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. I'm a structural engineer by trade, and I have been with AISC for about seven and a half years now. And currently, my role is Senior Structural Steel Specialist. I was in the Solutions Center at AISC for about three years. And with my current role, um, really my main goal is to promote structural steel to the AEC community and educate designers on how to achieve really the greatest project outcomes using structural steel. Uh, I would say my my side hustle, uh, so to speak, at AISC is uh, managing the initiatives on the construction economy and all of our market data. And that initiative is really developing tools and strategies to better educate our members on what's happening and how it will affect their businesses. So that's collecting data, analyzing data on the building market, uh, following trends in the overall economy, how that relates to the construction economy, and following price trends and and supply demand issues and kind of tracking that on a regular basis as well. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, I want to dig into that one. Uh, I wanted to talk about a little more about the building construction market. Can you provide our listeners with uh, more insight about what the building construction market is looking like right now and maybe the types of projects getting built and how it's evolved? Sure, absolutely. And to you know, kind of address this, there's really two parts you need to look at. You need to look at the residential component and also the non-residential component. Uh, when we look at the residential market, uh, that's, that's very strong. Uh, it's had strong year-over-year growth since coming out of the Great Recession. And we kind of started to see that level out in 2019, kind of from 2018 to 2019. That growth kind of started to, to flatten a little bit. Um, but really, that just came surging back in 2020. Um, when COVID hit, everyone wanted to you know, buy a bigger house or build a bigger house. Um, you know, now their kids are home, their spouses are home. Um, it was, you know, this 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 mad dash to to accumulate more space, um, and that really helped uh, both the single and multifamily housing markets. Um, non-res, uh, non-residential, I should say, it is a little bit different. Um, that was hit pretty hard by COVID. And square footage dropped by about 15% from about from 2019 to 2020. Um, we have begun to bounce back, uh, but still not where we were prior to COVID. And I think we'll touch a little bit later on, on just kind of the economic factors and, and when we might expect to, to kind of see that happen. Um, what's getting built um, is that's where things get a little bit interesting. Uh, we saw you know, a pretty sharp drop in office construction over the last few years. Uh, obviously, those people that were you know, had an office project in planning, well, maybe that's not a great idea anymore when you know, no one's in an office. So you know, we kind of saw a lot of those projects shelved. Um, education dropped a little bit, um, but 
historically it's been pretty steady and, and, and that'll probably continue to be pretty steady. Um, healthcare was kind of on a downward trend before COVID. It's probably about 20% down since 2017. Uh, so you know, that's that, that's not really due to COVID, uh, but we would expect that to uh, increase a little bit in the future and, and also be pretty steady, more predictable. Hotels, um, not not the same story. Um, COVID hit hotels probably the hardest of any market sector, and you know about 50% drop in hotel construction just you know from 2019 to 2020. And we don't don't really see that coming back too soon, but. Uh, Again, it's 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 really tough with the pandemic, um, to especially those project types that are hit hardest and the most vulnerable to COVID. Um, but unlike all of those categories, uh, we have also seen warehouses just uh, surge, and warehouses have surged, and retail has been sputtering um, for about a decade or so. And warehouses now account for about 43% of the non-residential market on a square footage basis, which which is kind of staggering. Uh, in 2018, it was 25%. So that was a lot in 2018, and now we're up to 43. So that is just uh, quite an increase um, in a very little amount of time. But I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit later too. So I have a quick question for you. And you know, you've mentioned the construction market. Do you look at any? Do you just look at the United States? Do you just look at, you know, United States and Canada? Do you look on an international level whenever you're doing your research? Uh, we look just at the U.S. Uh, okay. That's that's the scope of kind of what AISC uh, does. So yeah, that's that's primarily. Yeah, you know, there's a few situations where there's some international factors that that play in, like imports and, and tariffs and that kind of thing. You know, you you kind of have to talk about that. Uh, just because it affects you know, steel in this country too, uh, but in terms of building data and, and, and all that, we we are we're looking almost always just the U.S. And when you when you were looking at these markets, I know you made the mention that obviously distribution centers have been a key market driver, especially in the past couple of years, which makes sense because everyone's at home online purchasing whatever they want to purchase. I am guilty of that. Um, do you see any potential markets? I know you mentioned schools and but I think we may have glossed over like retail a little bit. Are we seeing anything kind of going back to 2019 levels and their level of growth? I know you had the mention that quite a few markets were kind of petering out like hotels. Um, do you see anything returning back to those 2019 levels of growth? Uh, well, I think we will see offices bounce back. I think it's too soon to say if they'll be back to 2019 levels. I, I think I think there were some fundamental changes in the way things worked. And I think any company that was considering some type of hybrid, you know, work from home policy or a total work from home policy, but were maybe a little too nervous to do it uh, or too worried, well, they kind of got the experiment forced. And, you know, for a lot of people, it worked. Uh, you know, AISC is a great example. Um, you know, we obviously all went home uh, and, when we came back, it was a hybrid policy, and you know now we we don't really need as much office space. Um, I think that's going to be pretty common, um, and that's probably going to cause a little bit of trepidation in, in the office market for a while. But there's also some industries that that's probably not going to work. And just look at structural engineering, for example. I'm trying to put myself in my sh my shoes when I was 23, um, 24, and think you know if I was working from home and and going to my you know entry level structure structural engineer job i would be a, a massive failure like there was no way I, I would learn anything or do anything correctly and it would be dangerous for anyone who inhabited any of those buildings um that's just you know, that's just not yeah, at least you're being honest in my opinion sure. in my opinion not a profession that you could uh work from home and and do um it, at least starting out you know when you're you're you know what you're doing and you're you know, a little more established, sure. Um, but I think as you know, a younger engineer in particular, you just, you need to have those other experienced people around. Um, so we'll see what happens with the office market. You know, it should recover. Uh, is it gonna be at pre-2020 levels? I don't know, not for a while probably, but um, 
you know, the, the data we see, it, it'll it'll get better, um, but it probably won't go back to pre-2020, at least in the foreseeable future. Um, what else? Uh, we see a, we see an increase in data center construction. Um, and the data we get, that's actually included in the office sector. Um, so we can't really totally separate that out. Uh, but we do know that you know, data centers are, are becoming a little more prevalent. You have all these e-commerce, all these distribution centers where they need to store your data on what you buy somewhere too. Um, so data centers are, are also pretty, pretty popular right now. Um, yeah, other than that, nothing has really, um, you know, stood out as, you know, as this kind of comes surging back or anything like that. Uh, so, so I do have a question though, but may, like maybe about the size of projects. Do you see the size of projects maybe changing? It seems as though, at least here in Texas, I mean, we have one that's in the news, of course, is the big Google headquarters that's coming, I think, to Austin. There's the Tesla manufacturing that's in Austin. There are, they're doing like renovations and huge construction ventures on all of our airports and our, um, infrastructure in Texas. So it, it, I feel as though Texas is a little bit kind of an interesting mix because we have all of these mega projects, but it seems as though there's also a significant amount of like smaller projects, but not so much like in the middle. Do you, do you have any opinion on, or do we see any evolution of just like a mix of either these like huge mega construction projects and these like little renovations or little construction projects elsewhere? Yeah, so this is this is actually really interesting and in how this is, has, has evolved over the years. Um, if you, you know, go back to 1995 and look at commercial building projects, and this is non-residential projects and residential projects greater than four stories. So basically, if we take out single and multifamily homes, um, you know, low-rise multifamily homes, in 1995, our average project size was about 18,000 square feet. Um, in 2010, our average project size in the U.S. was about 31,000 square feet. So really big increase. In 2021, our average project size in the U.S. is 54,000 square feet. So we went from 18,000 to 54,000 in, you know, from 95 to, to 2021. Um, that's, I mean, that's, you know, three times the size. That's incredible. Um, warehouses are a big part of this, and, you know, I'll give you some other crazy stats. We built 9,022 warehouses in 1995, and we built 2,000 781 warehouses in 2020. So we built about, you know, a third of the number of warehouses, um, you know, last year that we did in 1995. In 1995, the average warehouse size was like 20,000 square feet. And in 2020, it's 143,000 square feet. Um, so we are like, there are far fewer projects, but it's more actually square footage in, in the market. So uh, yeah, that does, you know, that does affect things. Um, fewer projects out there, but more work in those projects. Um, that definitely does kind of affect maybe how you, would, you know, run an engineering business or any construction related business. I mean, that, that does, that does matter. It's also, it's not only warehouses too. Um, you know, warehouses did not, you know, we saw almost a, a two times jump between 95 and, and 2010. That was kind of before this warehouse boom. So, you know, we were going that direction um, prior to the warehouse boom. And the warehouse boom just kind of took it and, you know, really, really magnified it. You know, that's kind of how we got to that 54,000 square foot per project. Um, so it's a combination of, both. Um, you know, that's taller buildings, but also, you know, huge footprint, uh, million square foot. Amazon behemoths. Um. <laughs> Which I just have a small note. One of the first like mega projects that I ever worked on was a manufacturing facility for Polaris. And it was so much fun. I did the inspections. I was just like a junior engineer at the time. And they gave me one of the Polaris vehicles to drive around this. I think it was like a million two square foot to do all of the inspections because it was just I had never seen a construction project that large where it was like that much dirt moving. But I remember it, it almost got me out of engineering because of course with a large manufacturing facility like that, they have um, 
like, of course, job openings. And one of the job openings was to test all of the Polaris vehicles, like out on their back track in the back in, in the woods. This was in Alabama where the land is cheap and you can build a million point two square foot and there's really, you're not doing too much damage in the project size, <laughs> in the project budget. But um, I just remember like them handing me the keys to this Polaris vehicle and they're like, yeah, you know, you gotta go do your inspections. <laughs> I was like, this, this structure is so large. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's making a lot more sense. Uh, even driving out to more of the remote areas where uh, there's those big warehouses, uh, even in California. Uh, yeah, it's amazing to see the size of them. Like you're passing by them and you see like their warehouse number uh, 97 or something like, wow, <laughs> that's so many, so many warehouses. Uh, Joe, I wanted to get your opinion on uh, the forces uh, like what forces in the overall economy would you say uh, drive the evolution of what we build as in the AEC industry and how can structural engineers particularly prepare and adapt to those changes? Well, I think today it's, it's probably more transparent than it's, than it's been in the past. Um, E-commerce was on the rise, you know, brick and mortar was on the decline. Uh, you know, we kind of saw that. Um, and then, you know, we had COVID hit and, and that that just accelerated what was already happening. Uh, you think of think of the older generation that never, you know, maybe bought things online. They're just, you know, they didn't grow up with that. Uh, maybe they were just hesitant or just they just didn't do it. You know, they, they were used to the, you know, the way they did things. Uh, and now it was you know, dangerous to go to the store or they were you know, hesitant to go out. And so you have this population that already, you know, buys things online all the time, but now you have a new population who's you know, doing it out of necessity and um, just accelerating, you know, that demand very, very quickly. Um, and to illustrate this, if we look at Amazon, who, you know, they've been investing tons of money in, in, in new construction. They built about 2.4 billion of warehouses in 20 years. And it looked like they were slowing down a little bit. Went from 2.4 to 1.3 in 2019. And then in 2020, it went to $4.6 billion of warehouse construction in the US. And then through about the first 11 months of this year, 2021, they almost had $6 billion of warehouse construction. So through first 11 months of 2021, they account for about 18% of the value of that warehouse market. Um, so yeah, that it, it's, it was a huge driver and it, you know, completely kind of uh, changed the landscape of, of what we were building very quickly. It, it was going to happen probably eventually, you know, but it probably expedited that by about seven to 10 years. Um, uh, just in time delivery is another kind of driver of, of the warehouse market. Uh, we, we discovered how vulnerable just-in-time delivery was um, to the supply chain disruptions that we're seeing. Um, companies, you know, any anyone who manufactures or sells anything and needs parts and pieces, uh, realize that that delivery method makes them very vulnerable to, to not having things. Um, and the old kind of business model for a lot of these places where we don't want to hold anything because of that you need to pay to store it somewhere. You, there's a holding cost associated with that, and you have a bunch of money sitting on your shelf. That you could be doing other things with, um, but now today they, they don't have that inventory to to replenish things, and and they're now realizing maybe we should um, have some storage space and some inventory built up because uh, this supply chain you know, is a little bit broken right now, and, and we're now realizing that you know, we're very vulnerable to that. Um, so that's another little bit of a factor that that will probably play in uh, to further warehouse construction as well. Um, also going to drive, I mentioned earlier, data center construction, that the e-commerce trends. Um, infrastructure spending could also have an effect. Um, I don't know how much on the building side, uh, likely something, um, but it, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out as well. Um, employment levels, um, those you know, usually affect the non-residential construction. And for residential buildings, uh, interest rates are you know, huge critical drivers. Um, you know, obviously, with the, the kind of perfect storm of interest rates and, and COVID um, in 2020, that you know, you're probably not going to see that happen very often. Hopefully not. Uh, 
you know, obviously that created a spike that we haven't seen in a long time. Um, but interest rates alone are, are a pretty good indicator of what home sales are going to be like. Um, what does this mean for you know an engineer? Uh, for a for a higher level engineer, I think, it, it, or a principal of a firm, or you know someone who's got to manage staff and projects and, and try to plan for you know the business and the future of the business, um, this kind of gives you the ability to plan. What types of projects are you typically working on? What's your bread and butter? What's your most profitable? Um, are those the projects that you, know, you are going to be fed to you in the future? Um, do you have the ability to transition if you're specializing in those projects that, that might not be really plentiful uh, in five years? Uh, do the clients that you work for, do the architects you work for have flexibility? Are they, you know, are, are they just chasing hotel uh, if you're doing a ton of hotel projects it's 2020 was probably a rough year for you uh, so do you have the ability to pivot does your staff have experience with these kinds of projects uh, do you need to hire more staff uh, if you look at warehouses warehouses typically don't require as much time or effort or, or billable hours um, there, there tend to be simpler structures uh, so it's something you need to consider it's something you need to consider the staffing um, but yeah, just uh, how to plan for the future of your business. Um, it's, it's really important and understanding kind of what factors are driving different types of projects are, are pretty quite critical. And for a younger engineer, it's, it's also important. You, know, you can identify opportunities to try something new. Um, is it a good time to switch firms? Is it a good time to develop some other skill sets that you might need to fill a gap if your firm goes after different types of projects? And, the, the principal engineer might be thinking we need to hire people, but you know if you go and, and research and educate yourself on something, maybe you, that guy doesn't need to go, or the woman doesn't need to hire people. Um, so it, it works both ways. And it's, I think it's really important to every structural engineer to kind of just have a baseline knowledge of this. And just kind of building off of what you just said. So when you're looking at the kind of building market of the future, we do see you know, obviously with the past couple of years, the building market has changed significantly. The pandemic just accelerated it. So when we look at how our engineering, our structural firms are now, you know, you made the mention that, you know, some of them practice like solely in education or solely in distribution center design. You know, how do you predict the building market, what it will look like in the future? And how can a structural engineering firm kind of course correct now? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and you, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, you, d you definitely want to have, you know, a good, um, you know, a, a good sample of projects in your, you know, your wheelhouse and, and know how to work with um, some different project types. Um, you know, and I know the, the firm I used to work for, we did, you know, we did a ton of retail work. Um, and you know, I think they've gotten into you know some other markets you know, pretty heavily as well, just because there's there's not there's not as much of that going on right now. Um, so yeah, you definitely you know you want to try to, to diversify and make sure you're you have experience in a few different arenas. Uh, but I you know, I can tell you the warehouse boom is probably not going away um, anytime soon, and it's probably going to continue to grow through 2023, and it will probably begin to contract but it's still going to be over 2019 levels you know, you know forecast it out to way all the way out to about 2026. Um, so it'll be the largest non-residential sector by far for a long time um, is, is what we're you know thinking. Um, so it, you know it won't go away I would you, know, you don't you, know, you don't it's not necessary to work in that sector uh, but there's going to be probably a ton of work um, you know, moving forward for the for the foreseeable future, um, and you know, I think education and healthcare is, is a safe bet um, to to at least you know, go after those projects. They're not going away. Um, government work as well will, will will probably always be there, and you know, office will will probably come back, not to the 2019 levels, uh, but I, it won't be drastically lower. Uh, we will still have a drive. We will still have a need for for office space. Um, but yeah, I, I think ultimately it's it's important to to have experience everywhere or as many places as you can, and you know not not try to zero in on, on 
one type of client because uh, the structural engineers were, were pretty much working for the architects. So what they're doing and what they're going after is, uh, you know, typically what we're going to do. Um, so if they're only building hotels, we should probably, you know, diversify a little bit. Um, yeah, great point about the diversifying. I know some firms got hit uh, a lot if they were just working on, uh, like you were saying, if they were mainly um, hotels and and any of those other ones, uh, they got hit pretty hard. Uh, but all the other ones that you mentioned, uh, they could use those to lessen the impact of the of the economy. Joe, how has the building materials evolved with with the market, or or has it? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Uh, we it's been a crazy crazy few years for the building materials world, uh, to say the least. And you know, we saw these you know, crazy spikes in wood prices to like you know, four four times what they were in the span of a few months. And then we saw those uh, come back down very very quickly. And then we saw you know, spikes in, in steel prices and you know, both in, in coil and in you know, wide flange, hot rolled sections. Um, and, and, and there's been you know, a lot of questions about those and, and, and just been a, it's been a time of uncertainty and volatility and, and, and everyone's kind of um, doesn't know how the projects are, are going to move forward and what the lead times are. So it, it's, it's really been, it's really been a challenge for you know, the building material world and just trying to solve and work through these things. Um, you know, really with the warehouse boom as well, uh, that's kind of created a, an opportunity for engineers to be a little bit more creative. And we've seen, you know, a really huge demand for long span drills uh, because, you know, we're building all these huge, huge open buildings and we you know, need those really long span joists. Um, so that's caused uh, increase in lead times. You know, if you, if you have this sudden, just uh, very high surge in demand for, for one product, it's, it's going to take longer to get. Um, but we've seen engineers kind of be creative and we've seen you know, you know, them use materials in, in new ways. And we, we've seen warehouses design using wide flange joist roots, or I'm sorry, wide flange beam roots, which you would never think you would do. Um, not as efficient as using a long span joist, but when you, know, you need to be a little innovative and you need to do things a little bit differently, um, I, I think that's just a great example of how a structural engineer can just say, hey, we can build this in a month if we do it this way. We can build it in five months if we do it this way. You know, yeah, we're not using the absolute optimal shape to do it, um, but it, it has to get done. And here's how it can happen. Yes, we need to use a, a, a bigger deck because we're not going to space wide flange beams at you know, four feet on center. But this is what needs to happen to get done. Um, and I think that's, that's great. And I think that's uh, you know, a way structural engineers should think about things. Um, I've had a lot of conversations with structural engineers over the past six months, uh, just about prices and, and what's happening and, and why it's happening. And they're, they're usually contacting me and um, saying, you know, I have an owner that, that doesn't know what, you know, if they should move forward the project because of what prices are going to do in six months. And of course we don't, we don't know what prices are going to be in six months. Um, if I did, I would, I probably wouldn't be here today. I would um, be on a boat uh, somewhere. Um, <laughs> what I always tell them is here, I'm going to walk you through, you know, how we got to where we are today, kind of the forces behind that. And, you know, you can then take that to the owner and explain that to them. And, you know, most often I, I hear this is actually, this is great. You know, I think he just wanted to ease his anxieties a little bit more about you know, why he's seeing these prices. Like he was ready to to kind of walk away from this project, he just thought everyone was was just inflating prices on him to, to just you know make more money. I think having this information and presenting it to him is going to be you know fantastic, um, and that's that's great. If a structural engineer can, can go to their client or their owner and say, "Here's you know what's going on with with materials. Here's here's why you're seeing price volatility. Here's why you're seeing increases." Um, First of all, I think they're going to be really impressed because I don't think they're going to expect a structural engineer to, to kind of come up with that and, and actually deliver it and, and have answers to these questions. Um, so they, I think they're going to love that. And they're, you know, I, I think it could actually drive projects forward. Um, I think having that information can you know, ease owners enough that they, 
they would you know, be less um, resistant to actually moving forward. So. so when we're looking at, um, when we measure the United States economic health, you know, how does this relate to the construction economy? Yes, yeah, another great question. Um, you know, there's, there's typically two main factors that you would look at, um, and it's you know, very common factors, GDP and employment levels. And you know, the gross domestic product level, it's probably the, the number one indicator, most universally accepted indicator of you know, over economic, overall economic health, but also correlates really well with non-residential construction. Um, actually, it's scary, scary how, how this works almost every time when you graph it out and you look at it. Um, the non-residential construction spending will typically lag GDP. And historically, um, when you see GDP fall, you start to see non-residential spending fall shortly after. GDP starts to rise again, eventually, um, and non-residential spending does not rise right away. Typically takes about 18 to 24 months uh, after GDP starts to rise for non-residential spending to rise. And that's kind of where, where, where we're at right now. Um, you know, we had a, a unprecedented, unprecedented drop in GDP and non-residential spending started to fall. And the following quarter, we GDP started to rise again. Non-res spending has been pretty flat. Um, but now we've had about five ish quarters of positive GDP growth. Um, so we would probably expect to see non-residential spending start to increase here in the next you know, two to three quarters. Um, if history continues to repeat itself, you know, we, don't, we don't know that's going to happen, but that tends to be the trend that we've seen in the past. Um, employment levels also can, can directly affect non-residential spending. And we really want to focus on the levels of employment. So usually when you hear about employment in, in the media, it, they're usually talking about unemployment rate. Um, but really we want to talk about the actual number of people employed uh, because the number of people employed, if that is increasing, that's you know, more people working, drives a higher demand for office space. More people working means more people traveling for work. That's going to drive more hotel space. That's going to drive retail demand. Uh, more manufacturing jobs would drive demand for more manufacturing projects. Um, so really looking at the levels of employment uh, is, is probably a better thing to look at than an unemployment rate. If we look at levels of employment right now, we're still you know, pretty well below pre-COVID um, levels of employment. Um, so we, we haven't come out, of, you know, come out of that yet. We are adding jobs. There's a lot of open jobs, uh, but we still are, are, are below no, that's great. And that's great input, especially for a lot of our engineers, you know, obviously we all work for someone. We're all in the business of making money and that's really important and understanding these market levels and how we can tailor it to our own knowledge of the market, um, I think is really impactful, especially for our listeners. Uh, Joe, I had a question about uh, something that you said uh, in, in the previous question about uh, why steel prices are going up. I do think, uh, I think uh, structural engineers would benefit from uh, that client relationship if, you know, if they have some uh, more information with their, with their contacts, maybe with the contractor, with the owner on, on why these uh, things are happening and what's causing them. Do you have a quick summary of that? Or, or maybe is there some place that we can go to figure that out? Yeah, absolutely. And I am, you know, I'm more than willing to talk with any structural engineer um, and, and kind of show them the visual aspects of it too, um, because I'm, I'm going to do my best to uh, explain this verbally, um, but it is, it is easier with charts and graphs and things. Um, so yeah, any, 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 any time I, I'm, I am available and willing to, to kind of sit down and, and go through this with, uh, with anyone out there who, who wants to do it. Um, but yeah, and then the long and short of it is this is, uh, this is a, a thing many industries experience. And if, if you look at steel consumption over the last two years, um, we saw you know, a tiny drop in, in, in consumption in the U.S. Um, in, in April of 2020. But for the most part, it, it never went down. Um, in fact, it, it really only went up um, recently. Um, so 
there was really never a drop in demand. And if you look at mill output, um, there that looks significantly different. Um, essentially, mills dropped from about 80% capacity utilization in you know, January 2020 to about 50 in April of 2020. Um, so we just started producing far less steel almost overnight. Um, there was a small consumption drop for about a month, but um, not for very long. And when you reduce capacity by that much, you can't exactly just turn it back on. Uh, however, on the consumption side, we did turn it back on. You know, we still wanted it. Uh, we just stopped making it in, in as large a quantity for you know, long enough that basically inventory levels went down and, and, and there was a, you know, a little bit of a supply shortage. That capacity utilization has crept back up slowly over or, you know, over time since it, it really bottomed out at around 50. And we're, you know, we're back to pre-COVID um, capacity utilization levels, which is great. Uh, that's, you know, it's, it's good for the industry moving forward. Um, you know, we've seen coil prices already start to come down. Um, so that's, that's a positive sign. Um, wide flange prices have not yet you know, begun to come down, but you also have to consider they, they did not increase nearly as much as, as coil prices. Um, so, I think it's a good sign, you know, consumption is, is healthy and really if, if you couple that consumption with um, just the mill output and what COVID did to the mill output kind of overnight, uh, it kind of just tells you why you know, we're at where we're at. But it also tells you, hey, we're, we're back to making you know, pretty much what we were making pre-COVID, if not more. Um, and there's, there's mills that have even planned for, for expansions and, and more, more output future. Uh, so that's a good sign. Um, I think it will take more time just to get inventories back up, um, you know, because they were they were down to zero. Service centers didn't have anything anymore, um, and you know, you gotta you gotta build that stock back up um, to have you know, a little more uh, comfort level with the market. But it looks like that's you know, that's going to happen, and, and we're on you know, we're on a good road. So Joe, again, easier to here. see with. Uh, Okay. Easier to see with, you know, some, some charts and graphs and things like that. <laughs> do you have a, sorry, do you, I just for the, the viewers Sorry. that wanted to, to, to do that, is there, what's the best way to, to contact you? Is there a LinkedIn or a, an email address or? Yeah, my email address is uh, dardis, D-A-R-D-I-S at A-I-S-C dot org. Sounds good. Yeah. I think uh, for any viewers that want to do that or contact you, that's, uh, we'll make sure to put that on the, the website as well. Yeah, and Joe, you mentioned, of course, that it's always a little bit easier to have graphs and everything in front of you. Are there any resources available that could help, you know, the engineers that listen are listening to understand more about the evolving and building market? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we we do maintain a, a price list for wide, a typical wide flange and a can steel consumption index on our economics page at aisc.org/slash economics. Uh, that's a public uh, public facing page, so anyone can access that. Uh, we're also, you know, as I mentioned, we're more than willing to to sit down and kind of have a, a data brief with you know any any AEC professional that's out there, and either myself or or one of the other specialists uh, around the country uh, is happy to to kind of walk through this stuff and explain it to them. Um, it's it's very valuable, you know, for a structural engineer to be able to sit down in a, in a meeting, a client meeting or an owner meeting and, and have this information kind of in their back pocket. I can assure you, they don't expect you to have it. So if you do, I think it's, it's great and it can really help, you know, kind of move a project and, and, and really put people more at ease if they, they kind of know what's going on. And, you know, at a firm level, it's, it's also, it's great to have this information. What do I expect? What do I expect the you know most you know, prominent project type to be in five years? Am I am I kind of aligned to you know, my firm aligned to to be successful in five years from now? Do we have the staff we need? Do we you know go, need to go out and find people with different skill sets? Do I need to train internally for you know, develop people with different skill sets? Do I need to learn um, you know different materials? If, you know it, uh, it, that could be the case too if you've you know, only done wood and now you're um, you know, going into the warehouse market, well, they're not building many wood warehouses. So you, you, you know, need to you know, get a little more experience with steel. Maybe 
you need some typical details, but still, if you don't, if you don't work in that arena. So it's, um, yeah, it's very valuable and, and we're happy to, you know, you can, you can contact me, you can contact any of our other specialists. Um, we all have pages on the AISC website um, and we'll be happy to, to help moving forward. And you said that page with all of your economic data on it is AISCE.org backslash economics? AISC.org backslash economics. Perfect. Well, Joe, I think that kind of sums up our time today. Thank you so much for all of your input. I really enjoyed these conversations. I got a little bit into market research for a while back in my past position, and it was so interesting to hear your input and to have you on. Thanks. It was great uh, to be on the podcast today and uh, had a great time. And uh, again, anyone can contact me if you have any questions. Thanks, Joe. I hope you enjoyed the episode today. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, or any questions you may have. To leave them, please visit structuralengineeringchannel.com. There you will find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, which is episode number 67, as well as any links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during the episode. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Until next time, we wish you the best in all your structural engineering endeavors.